The magnificent architecture of the City of London reflects Britain's brilliant commercial heritage. These proud buildings, old and modern, boast of the city's history as one of the world's greatest financial centres. But the City of London is also home to a huge number of incredibly beautiful 17th century churches. And, remarkably, they were all built by one man, one of the most prolific ecclesiastical architects this country has ever known. I've come to find out the story behind this great church building frenzy and the place where it all started. Church architecture in London was transformed by one single event in history, the Great Fire of 1666. It started on September the 2nd and raged for five days. By the end of it, virtually the whole of the medieval city of London had been destroyed. This monument stands to commemorate the devastation and it was built by the man who was to rebuild the city. Sir Christopher Wren. Within days of the fire, Wren submitted drawings to the newly restored monarch, a flamboyant Charles II, detailing grand plans for rebuilding the entire city. A royal commission was appointed to redevelop the city, and Wren was to be its principal architect. Top of his list was to rebuild 51 of the city churches. London's disaster was his opportunity. And there are very few places around here that don't in some way bear his mark. Around every corner of the city is a Wren masterpiece. Inspired by images of the architecture of Paris and Rome, Wren was thrilled to get the chance to practice his architectural skills on a scale that others could only dream of. But the king decided London had to retain the old layout of its crooked medieval streets. Wren's ambitions completely to alter the cityscape with grand avenues and boulevards were put to one side. He had to be content with redesigning each church individually in the restricted spaces left behind. Nonetheless, what he did was to change forever the architectural face of London. This was to be a new Protestant city. A complete picture of what Wren was trying to create is rare to find in its original form. Only one or two of his churches made it through to the 19th century without alteration. This is one of them. Just off Cannon Street and surrounded by a maze of tiny lanes is this little courtyard. And in it stands the church of St Mary Abchurch. It's a neat building built of brick with stone dressings, nice big windows, a small tower and spire. But we've come here because this is one of the few Wren churches that looks the same as it would have done 300 years ago. To show me how it reflects the history of the time, I'm going inside to meet James Campbell, Wren expert and architect himself. When Wren designed these churches, he, of course, was working um, in a post-Catholic Anglican world. Um, doubtless the plan of this building in no sense reflects what had been here before. The old medieval St Mary was presumably a very different kind of building. Indeed, not just that. We've got to remember that we've had the Puritan, the, the Cromwellian Revolution. We've had the Civil War, and that's been a time of oppression. And this is after the Restoration. So King Charles II has come back, and everybody is celebrating. And they want, so they don't want a Puritan church. They want a slightly more elaborate church than that. But they're, cons they're always worried about being Catholic. The great mm. enemies of the Catholics, so it mustn't be popish or over elaborate. And this is the tension we find in these churches. So hang on, yes, this is interesting because because the the ideas that Wren is using are, are, are frequently drawn from Italy or France, Catholic countries, and yet here he is hanging them more on to, onto an Anglican framework of, of observance and worship. And this framework demanded a strict set of criteria in its design, without columns, so everyone could see with a dominant pulpit for delivering powerful sermons and with an almost unassuming altar space. This was the age of reason. Wren was a scientist, a rationalist, and this is reflected in the clever design of these apparently simple churches. 
This is a light and rational space, beautiful clear windows, everything is very apparent to the eyes and to the senses. And a dome, very surprisingly. How did he achieve that structurally? Well, this is where Wren as a scientist really comes into play, because not only does he understand the artistic side of architecture, the drawing, the idea of technical draftsmanship, which he'd grown up with, but also he understood how to put something like this together. So here he produces a dome that looks like it's made out of masonry, mm. but it isn't. It's made out of timber. All this plaster work covers up false timber work, and it's an illusion. It's a Baroque illusion of a dome. Is this a rehearsal for St Paul's? After all, he must be thinking about how to do a really huge dome in these years. Well, I think it's more about the idea of having a dome is so revolutionary in England at this period. There were no domes in England of any sort, over a church, anywhere else. Wren is importing this idea from the continent. So, domes he's seen in France on his trip in 1665. He comes back excited. He's dreaming of doing domes. And when he gets a commission to do the, the city churches in 1670, here's his opportunity. And he grabs it. So, yes. so wherever he gets the opportunity to put in a dome, he does. And, and this is one of the most splendid examples. The dome became a hallmark of Wren's work, as did his contrasting use of dark and light. So the woodwork uh, strikes a very definite, rich, dark note, uh, uh, and then you get the zone of cream-coloured wall with these lovely clear windows. Yes, the idea was very much that you have a dark zone down here where we as parishioners sit in the earthly world, and up above you have the sublime, everything above head height when you look up is a sublime world of light, of, of white, of purity. This building's a bit like an auditorium, and it has at the centre of it the most extraordinary pulpit. Shall we go and look at it? It is extraordinary, isn't it? And Wren, when he's talking about the design of churches, actually is very clear that the pulpit is the center and that you must design the church so that everybody within the church can hear the sermon going on. It's got this enormous sounding board which stretches out. It's the most prominent thing in the middle of the church. This is derived from Dutch architecture, where you find these amazing sounding boards and pulpits right in the centre of the church. And a measure of that centrality is the fact that it's so extremely ornate. It's got lovely classical foliage carving and cheerful little putty. There's certainly nothing Puritan about this pulpit, is there? <laughs> um, yes, very much so. If you could, you showed off as a parish by making the most elaborate pulpit you could possibly afford. Although the wooden pulpit features some beautiful workmanship, the highlight of St Mary's woodwork is the reredos, the screen behind the altar, which was carved by the great 17th century woodcarver Grinling Gibbons. He was really the most fabulous artist uh, woodcarver in Europe at the time, wasn't he? I mean, how on earth is it done? I mean, I, I take it that what Grinling Gibbons does is to just carve back wood and go on and on and on and on until the, the, the plant forms is it, are exposed, is that right? But how, how is it that his chisel never missed? <laughs> for, a start, for a start, of course, Gibbons uh, knows about wood which other carvers of the period haven't experimented with. They've always used oak. Oak is the English thing to use. Gibbons knows his woods, and he chooses to build the, his sculptures out of lime wood. And build is the right word. Oh, ah. Because they're made of separate pieces. Oh, I'm disillusioned now. I mean, oh, I no, you shouldn't be. <laughs> this is a technical leap forward. Ah. Because everybody had always thought that sculpture should be carved back. But Gibbons realises you can get the most amazing effects by building it up in layers. And they're very clever layers. And they are mechanically fixed together with pins. Oh, I see. Because glue would have required too large a surface. And this means that you can put layer on layer on layer and build up this extraordinarily rich decoration. Because you've got grapes and, and, and roses and, uh, any, and no end, you've got, I don't know what those are, apples and peaches. It's like one of Carmen Miranda's hats, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, it's kind of extraordinary, kind of frou-frou creation. But it's dignified. I mean, it's, it's symmetrical, for one thing, isn't it? It's like a Dutch still life. Of course, it's like a Dutch still life because Greenland Gibbon starts life in Holland. And he grew up in Holland. He was probably trained in carving in Holland. And he comes over and he shocks and excites the English public with these extraordinary displays of virtuosity. A 
And in complete contrast to the medieval churches, there are no Christian images here. There's no Christ on a cross or Virgin Mary, only the written Word of God. The Word was the most important thing to the Protestant church. Listening to sermons was vital. This was a place to come and contemplate God, and where better to do so than in one of these finely preserved Wren box pews. Well, I absolutely love all this carved woodwork, isn't it beautiful? Yes, and it serves a purpose, of course, because you can look through it, because oh. these are the oh, yeah. original box pews. They're very comfy. Now, if the point of these box pews, of course, is that it, you have a stone floor. It's very cold in the church. So raised up on this wooden platform, you're insulated from the floor and the walls keep out the drafts. So you would rent a pew like this and tucked away in here behind this door through those long restoration sermons that could go on for one, two, three hours. You could read a book, play with the family, relax, sleep, and nobody would be any the wiser. Still found around every corner of the city, the Wren churches are a unique product of 17th century religious thought. The Great Fire of London allowed Wren to transform the capital's churches to reflect the new Protestant ideals of the English people. But, as we shall see, many of the aesthetic features of Wren's architecture, such as the simplicity of design and the focus on words rather than images, also found favour at this time with another very different religious group. A group which was increasingly playing an important part in the commercial life of the city, the Jews. 